Well, welcome everybody. So this session is on uh, the open source tool chain for recycling plastics. So it's one of those things because plastic is one of the main, it's, it's a big, big part of society today. There's like, you can divide society into technology. It's like biomass, there's plastic, there's metal, ceramic. I mean, those are the main things. Plastic is huge. It's, a it's like trillions of dollars. I don't know exactly. I think it's, it's over a trillion or so of economic equity. So it's a big deal. And we can, many people can get involved with that in terms of recycling. So why, why do we care about an infrastructure for recycling? Does anyone care here? Maybe, maybe let's get some feedback on why do people here care about it? I guess the simplest one would be we want to leave the world better than you were, we're, we're giving. So it's my, my take on it. Yeah. And so, so you think that's, that's got a lot to do with cleaning up the environment? Yeah. The first impact we can do is decrease the impact we are making currently. Yeah. If we can reuse a lot of the products that we do, do use, from, I mean, the, the vision is ultimately, okay, we've got an operation here, we, you know, trash bags, p plastic parts, things that are plastic that break. You can recycle all of that, and it's actually not super difficult to do that. A lot of the plastics that are out there are recyclable. Uh, they're designed to be recycled, so it's a great thing to do. And we can do it, fortunately, in the open source, because some, some machines already make it available to do that. So the reasons, uh, there's... I would say four main reasons. So we mentioned about the environmental reasons, absolutely. Uh, at a deeper level too, we can eventually talk about in our program as we move from machines to making parts for machines, we eventually get down to materials. And with materials, we can make bioplastics. There are bioplastics that have been around for a long time, like cellophane or, um, yeah, Windows for airplanes used to be made out of recycled, re, re, uh, it's called reformulated cellulose. Cellulose has been a, a material for, for making bioplastics for a long time. And it's actually something you can do without actually too much difficulty on a small scale. There's things like uh, cellophane, there's starch bioplastics, there's polylactic acid. Do people know where polylactic acid comes from? Uh, polylactic acid is the parts in the 3D printer that we're working with right now. Does anyone know where that comes from? It's, it's lactic acid, like in milk, but it's, it comes from starches. I think they do it from corn typically these days, but it's bacterial. Um, so it's, it's actually not too bad. It's bio biology working for us. They eat up sugars and they produce plastic as a byproduct. And you concentrate that and there you got bioplastic. So it's, it's also something we can do in terms of a bioreactor on a small scale as well, which is, which is interesting. But if we talk about the mainstream plastics out there, uh, environmentally, definitely we can, many people can get involved in recycling and, and making very useful things like 3D printing filament. So that, that's a reality today. And the cost is one of the main, main issues. For us to here, cost is one of, one of the other things. Um, because if you get to do recycling of plastic, what does it cost you if you have a small machine? it costs you essentially the, the cost of electricity it takes to melt the plastic. Now on the wall there, that's, a, that's an example of a recycling machine or that's a, that's a filament extruder. Now it's actually not so complex. All it is is a hopper where you, now that thing, we ran it on pellets, which you can get off the shelf. Uh, you can also do regrind, which is kind of stuff we'll be doing with the, the grinder machine. But the cost is, you see that uh, there's a metal pipe, a half inch pipe with a half inch auger, just like this, and a heater element on the end. It's, uh, it's like a 200 watt heater. So all you're doing is, it's costing you the cost of electricity to run that heater, plus the motor that's on top of there, and you can be making plastic. So actually, uh, We'll, we'll do that on the, in another day, but, but I did do a full roll of, of ABS plastic, 3D printing filament. It just works. I mean, with minor controls, like that one actually is, is fed by gravity. It pools. When you have the temperature in a separate, certain setting, it falls by gravity, and then it's spooled on. We'll get, we'll get into that when we actually do end up using it. But it's not too difficult to, to actually make very useful things like 3D printing filament, which is one very high value form of, of how you can recycle plastic. So what is the cost? Well, recently there's a, 
recently the Recyclobot, um, Recyclobot is one of the machines that are available out there in the open source for 3D printing. Uh, so there's a paper that came out, this is just last month, and, and they pu finally published, as I mentioned, the academic open source kind of stuff, in Hardware X, which is actually an, a journal of open source hardware. So that's, once again, from the Michigan Tech University, Dr. Pierce, who's actually one of our advisors, uh, not an advisor, but he's on the board of directors. He's behind it. So they published a reprobable Recyclebot open source 3D printable extruder for converting, converting plastic to 3D printing filament. So one thing that gets me here Let's look at some of the numbers on it. What, what can it do? Um, so if it costs about 700 in parts for everything in there, it can produce, it takes about two and a half hours to produce a one kilogram spool of filament, which means that in a day you can make like 10 rolls or so. But the cost, if you have free plastic, if you recycled it, if you ground it up yourself, is 2.5 cents a kilogram. Now that is good because, because filament costs you about $20 a spool. So what is that? It's uh, less than 1,000 times commercial filament costs, which means that you can now be printing large useful things like this table. You know, this tabletop surface, you can even print the legs and stuff like that. Otherwise, it's just impossible. If this thing weighs like 10 pounds, it would be like $200. So economics are certainly a big, big factor if you want to get into productivity on a small scale. Um, using recycled, recycled waste, you can uh, do that with existing machines. So that's, that's, I think, a great milestone. So a machine like that, if you actually s say you're, you're making 3D printing filament, it'll take you, what do, what do they say, it'll take them like two weeks, what is it? Um, it's like a, about, so you can build it in about 24 hours, but it's like a week or two of production, like to not, not even a week. If you actually have this thing running in a few days, you know, if you make like 10 spools at $20 a spool, you know, it's like 200 bucks a day. So in a few days, you're actually making enough value that you paid for the materials. That's great. That's awesome. So that's that's a definite good addition. So um, that's one of the the machines that is working with us here. I went out there to actually to uh, build that thing. And I've got, uh, we can show some of, some of that at work. Uh, so for me to summarize the, the four main, main things is printing large things. So you, you of course want to have, if you're going to be printing large items, you want to have a big filament extruder, a bigger one like 1.2 millimeters or higher. You, you can print large objects, cost is absolutely there, environmental issues, and then the public, dis, distributing this out to, pub, to the public, public production, which is always the theme here. So what are some of the machines? What are some of the challenges to this? Right now, um, the main challenge to this, it's a, it's a great idea to recycle things, but the only challenge is that you can only do it so many times before the, the actual chem chemical molecules, they get short enough that they don't really work in a, an extruder anymore. You can't squeeze them out anymore. They become kind of like honey or a consistency that just kind of oozes. It doesn't really form a, form a nice filament. It's, it's hard to work with. It just degrades. So for PLA, I believe that number is like three or so, three or five times that you can recycle it. Um, and then you have to go back to the original chemistry, how, how the PLA was synthesized you can reformulate it to, to make it actually work again, but that means some more chemical processing to do that. For ABS, it's more like five to ten times that you can recycle it. So, I mean, still, that's great. So if you talk about five times, then every time you're making filament, you, you might have to add, you know, 20% of new, newer stuff. You're recycling all the old stuff, and then you've got to add some, some new stuff to it. Um, so that, that's perhaps a, a major limit. And until recently, until the last few years, there were no open source extruders. The Lyman filament maker, which, which is that machine there, that came out um, a few years ago. The iteration that we have hanging on the wall there, that's, that's um, like V6 of it. Um, but a few years ago, you weren't even able to do that in the open source. Right now, you can at, at a rel relatively accessible way. So, but I would say that, um, if we talk about distributing production of, of all kinds of goods, in my view, the missing link is still like product, good product designs. 
excellent designs for things like your cordless drill or whatever, or those good, high quality products, that means you're refining that a lot, you go through an involved development process to the point that it just works and it's better than anything else. That's the missing thing and we gotta work on that to, to make many products producible in a small micro factory. So, uh, but let's talk more about the machines that are currently available. So the main, there's four main machines that are available for the recycling part. The Lima Filament Maker, which is, uh, all the resources for it are out there, including full CAD design and free CAD. We actually did that part of the team last year. We've got fully complete documentation on that. So if you ever want to put that into free CAD, view it. Uh, so this is, uh, this page here is, that's the actual spool of filament that I made pretty recently, but that's, that's the machine. Um, let's see, where did that tab go? Lyman filament maker. <clears throat> this works out of the box. When I ran it here first, uh, I produced that spool on the first run. So it's not super difficult. And that was ABS, which uh, commercial pellets, which is relatively easy. But if you're going to do any kind of plastic, like whatever, polypropylene, whatever the recycling numbers are in the things that you use, there's a lot of, let's say, high density polyethylene. That's, for example, easy to make filament out of. It's harder to print. You know, the common things are polyethylene, polypropylene, PET, which is the common like soda bottles, probably the water bottles. Uh, that's readily uh, pretty much doable these days. Uh, so you can do a lot. Uh, PT is, I think, well, in terms of being a widely accessible plastic that's easy to print with, PET is, is one of them, so there's options. Um, this machine is fully open source, replicable. The parts are 3D printed, uh, like, like the casing, there's electronics inside of there. But the way it works is essentially you have to keep a temperature constant, so you have a little sensor and a control loop that keeps the temperatures at a, at a constant value, and you're simply extruding from the barrel which is just a metal pipe and a, and a simple auger like this uh, for the, the filament maker, the, the Lyman filament maker. It's just a half inch auger like this. You can use a professional screw, but these things work well enough. And a professional screw, you get more control and maybe you can, you can get perhaps higher quality. But the quality I got initially from, from that one was like plus minus like 0.1 millimeter, which is good. Like I, know I did three millimeter filament so plus minus 0 0.1, I mean, one millimeter is tiny, 0 0.1 is, is relatively good, so it looks, looks like it's high quality. So next, next on the machines. The second one is the RecycleBot, which just got published, and we built that, um, and it needs more work. There's, it's the thing I was saying about the open source, where uh, it's academic open source, means it just gets published. We, we didn't collaborate on that a lot, but we built it, I went out there, it's, um, it's a pretty decent design and it's, uh, we'll, we'll see that, we'll, we'll demonstrate how some of the parts work on that on another day over here. Um, so now how do you generate the actual regrind and that's, uh, we're building upon the work of Pla Precious Plastic, that's a well-known project out there for plastic recycling and the plastic shredder it's a thing you might have seen on the, so that's, that's how it looks. It's the thing uh, that was on a tabletop in the workshop. Um, all the full CAD files are available. You can send that out for, for cutting from a local fab shop, like CNC shop. Uh, it cost me, for one set, it's, it's $150 for the parts. But with some minor welding there, uh, you can put that together and it works quite well. The secret to it is, um, like the particle size, if you, if you have a, it has a screen on the bottom as well, so the, the size of the particles that come out are determined by the whole, whole size on the screen. Otherwise you might have a, a piece get ground up and if it falls straight through, it might be of a very much irregular size. Some pieces might be large, some pieces might be small. 
uh, but if you have a screen underneath with regular sized holes, then everything will be just above the size of that hole. So that works. Um, that's, um, we were thinking about, it's actually, I, I did a little bit of experimentation. How, how can you actually simplify that? Can you do it with just like pieces of quarter by two steel that, that are uh, just cut at a 45 degree angle? I think you can do that. Um, but the thing I did notice is that efficiency maybe comes in in the sense that it takes a bit of energy to, to crank it and you'll see it when you do it, we'll, we'll play with that when you do it by hand. So the less refined the blade structure is, the blades in this are kind of like these star shaped, nice pointy. With this simple, simple kind of a shape, it might be harder for it to cut because it's, it's just, just a very basic shape, but it will still work. Um, the idea here is on the, these, there are slow spinning, high torque versions. There's also other versions which are very fast spinning and they're just, they're more like hammer mill style versus shredder. A shredder is a small moving blade that essentially cuts pretty slowly with high torque. Uh, as, but as far as uh, more the hammer mill style, it's very fast, like 3000 RPM. It just breaks the things apart by impact. Um, so this is... Uh, the thing I mentioned about this is this does lend itself to solar operation, as in if you have a high torque hydraulic motor attached to this, you definitely have the high torque, and it can go very slowly, uh, but if you just leave it all day going like that, it's, it's an effective setup to, to work with. Um, let me go back, back up. So that's the filament <clears throat> grinder. Now, for the, the extruder part, there's actually the three options. There's precious plastic, there's Lyman, and there's the Recyclobot that are the main contenders out there. I like the precious plastic because that's, that's a little bigger and it has like a one inch barrel and stuff happens, so it uses one of these bigger, bigger bits to push the material through. But basically what it's doing as it spins, you're simply, just like a, a, like a drill bit, when you're spinning this, and actually you don't spin it the same way a blade does because that makes the flutes go that way, actually spin it in reverse and it's actually moving forward. So it's simply moving material along into the hot melt zone and it's just extruding out and the, and the thing that happens at the end, it's simply a cap with a small like a one, one millimeter or two millimeter hole in it. Um, it actually, the way the Recyclobot works you are, once it melts, you're pulling, and the pulling speed determines how fat the filament's gonna be. So you actually like the hole to be a little bigger. Like for example, if you're doing 1.85 millimeter, so 1.85 and three millimeters, uh, 1.75 and, yeah, and about three millimeters are the standard widths. Um, but if you wanna do, generate 1.75 millimeter, you'd start with like two or three millimeter of a hole and then depending on how fast you pull it, it's going to reduce it to that length. So you can get whatever thickness you like based on how fast you're pulling on it. So that's, that's the way these things work. So the precious plastic one is a little larger. It's got the bigger, bigger screw, which means it tolerates more, I mean, it's more forgiving as in if you've got like not so super finely ground chunks of things, there's just bigger things can fit into this as opposed to a, a half inch before it plugs up and just doesn't work for you. So that's, that's that basically. Um, let's see. So that, that kind of covers the, the work on this. Now, the precious plastic work, it's relatively well documented. They have the CAD files, the build procedures. Their instructions are not that great. Like. Um, I mean, they're short, it's just essentially a video that you can follow that. What we did in our, like, like the grinder part, what we did is, that's where you can combine 3D printing to make, make the build easier. And if you have a, if you're trying to make the film and grinder, what they do there is use regular bearings, round bearings that, that go around the shaft. So that means, uh, but, the, but the actual cutting wheels, it's on a hex shaft so that they hold. So you basically put, on, put all the hex, um, put all the blades on a hex, hex blade, so that means they cannot spin freely. 
so they're attached that way. But that means the end of the shaft has to be round for a ball bearing to go around it. So another way to do it is use a hexagonal bearing, which exists. So that's what we did on ours. We used a hex bearing, so a hex shaft fits into it, a one inch hex shaft. And then uh, the bearing goes in a housing, but the housing we 3D printed, so we're able to do like for $10 for that, uh, the bearing part, plus the 3D printed part, we're making our own bearings, which are 100% infill, pretty strong, uh, big structures to, to make it work. So you can simplify things, therefore you don't have to mill the, the ends of the shaft any. Uh, normally you would, you would mill it to mill it or put it on a lathe to get the round shaft from a hexagonal shaft. So that's, that's a detail of how 3D printing can, can facilitate uh, the build process of a thing like the shredder. So, um, yeah, let's see. What else do you want to talk about here? So, um, I don't know, let's, let's probably get back into the workshop. And we'll play with these machines a little bit to see how the shredding works and how the filament making works. We know that, you know, on a machine like that, we can work with the commercial pellets. That works absolutely. We can experiment doing things like, okay, let's regrind that, that yellow casing that, that the rods came in. Let's run it through this, see if we can make some filament. And, it, it probably might take take a little bit of uh, finagling, so you might uh, have to shift around on the temperatures, the pull speed, and stuff like that. So it might take a little bit of time, but once you have a formula like a recipe, like cooking, then you can do that on a on a on a regular basis. But of course, you'd have to have uh, regular feed stocks. Like if that's all we have for that yellow stuff, and you spent all this time figuring out how to do it, and then okay, you don't have any more, and that formula kind of went away until you get more of those rods and things like that. So so it's it's art to you know, generate a library of formulas that that are robust, that that work with readily sourceable feedstocks. You know, things like plastic jugs, like gallon jugs, milk jugs, or or containers from all kinds of food. That's that could be a very regular feedstock. So we can create formulas for that and make it happen. So in summary, like all of this stuff is, I mean, it's quite doable at home. When when I first ran this thing here to make the filament. It was, it was quite pleasing and surprising. It was a good victory day in the sense that stuff just works. Um, and then of course to, to do other things, other filaments, uh, including things like, like rubber, like think about recycling the rubber on your, uh, if we make our tracks or wheels for tractors. I mean, then when the thing wears out, you can recycle it and you can make new treads or, or new tires, which is something that's I think that's pretty exciting. I mean, it totally bypasses this whole industrial chain, like, you know, all the garbage dumps with the burning tires and whatever, um, all that stuff that goes into the landfill now can start coming back to, to regular use. But for rubber, I mean, there's the rubber from, from rubber trees that that's not that recyclable. That's like, that's got these sulfur bonds that it's kind of like, it sets once you, you can't recycle it well. But there's other thermoplastics that are rubber that are recyclable, like thermoplastic urethanes or other materials that completely work. And, and t there's tires made from those currently, so that's it's an industry standard process. So if we get our hands on some of that material, we can recycle it and make new new tires forever. So it's really good. Um, yeah, I think I think let's wrap up here. That's just a brief overview of what we can do. What are some of the questions here about, I mean, the questions are what are the limits and, you know, what's really possible, and we'll see some of that. Does anybody still use natural rubber if uh, your thing does the same job? I, as far as I know, the, the, the rubber, there's different types of rubber, and, and I think it gets you some properties that are unique, like maybe higher temperature or something. So, and it's definitely a huge market. They still grind natural rubber in the tires. My wife works in here. Oh, yeah? <laughs> and they recycle it, but they can only do, like, Chunks of um, it. I don't know about the recycling. I yeah. Feel it still comes in 80 pound blocks and it gets thrown in the grinder. Huh. So you can, I guess, recycle it the same way, you just make particulates and not try to assimilate it chemically with what it's going into. Well, the thing about the, the natural rubber is that it's sulfur that's added to it. I think that's <coughs> sulfuric acid to the resin. Yeah. And that's what makes it set. It's not thermal, thermal. Plastic thermal means that it melts when you raise the temperature. Yeah. The rubber that's in the standard tires, it does not melt. It will just pyrolyze. It would burn yeah. if you get it high enough. It wouldn't go through the molten phase. That's just not what the natural rubber does, the way its chemistry works. So it's a little different. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.